and looking forward to that. But tonight I've got a great speaker, uh, Mr. Nicky Septus from Birmingham. Nicky is a speaker. He's also a tour guide. I'm talking about a tour guide. Uh, he just got back from East Island, the South Pacific, Rio de Janeiro. He goes on these big cruises and, and gives tours of Europe. He also does a lot of tours in, uh, on the rivers in the United States and everything like that. He's also a guest speaker for a lot of different functions. Sons of Confederate Veterans, he's spoken to uh, the Birmingham Civil War Roundtable. Matter of fact, Greg and I went down and heard him give a talk down there on the Battle of Fort Sumter. But I thought the Battle of Chattanooga would be more appropriate for us right here since it's a lot closer and uh, got a lot more uh, influence in this area. But anyway, Nikki, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to visit here with you and appreciate the invitation to join you tonight. Uh, it's kind of intimidating, though, when you're talking about a battle in the war between the states to people who are specialists in the war between the states. Now, I am not. It's I, I am a tour guide, and all the information I'll be sharing with you is from the work that I've done over the last 40 years. This is the 40th year this year when I began working as a tour guide and as a speaker on cruise ships. Now, several people ask me, usually when we begin, are you a school teacher or a university professor? What are you doing talking to us about history and culture and all these things? I would love to be able to claim the credentials of a school teacher or a university professor, but I cannot. All the information that I'll be sharing with you is from the work that I've done over the last 40 years, working as a tour guide, carrying people to some of the great man-made wonders all around our planet, it's been about 130 countries and all seven continents, and other times when we're in places like Antarctica or up in Greenland in the high Arctic, um, we're looking at sites created by hand much greater than that of man. As a matter of fact, if you'll hit the lights, I think we can get a little bit better projection yeah. here at the front. We're also working for a number of adventure tour operators. What's it like to get up to 19,340 feet to the roof of Africa here, Kilimanjaro, on the border of Tanzania and Kenya, or in hot air ballooning across the Serengeti? It's an awful lot of fun. We're doing a bicycle ride all the way across Venezuela. It's like the tallest waterfall in the world. This is Angel Falls, 3,212 feet of a cataract, the largest in the, in the world. We're also paddling canoes on tributaries of the Amazon, and then looking at what I think is some of the most spectacular scenery, not just in South America, but anywhere in the world. We're down in Patagonia, the southern tip of the continent by Cape Horn, looking at the Torres del Pan and the Los Pacietes National Park. And then my favorite, the four-day hike in the Andes to the lost city of Machu Picchu, the great city of the Inca. Other times we're in Southeast Asia, we're looking at the remnants of the Khmer civilization in Cambodia, or we're looking at the great valley of the pagodas in Myanmar, it used to be Burma, and then one of the most unique bridges in the world. This is in Vietnam, this is uh, close to Saigon, and it's called the Golden Bridge. It's one of the most unique in all the world. Other times we're doing programs say in Australia, a couple of my favorite places, and New Zealand. Just got back on the track after COVID had shut everything down for about two years with cruising and with land tours. These people are just now operating again. And then in the Middle East, before it became such a contentious place to visit, we were doing camel safaris across the Sinai, just the footsteps of Moses or across the Wadi Rum in the footsteps of Lawrence of Arabia, looking at the great rock city of Petra or going up to the Fortress here at Masada in Israel, and then floating down the Nile on the Palookas. Now we're in the United States, we do a lot of programs. We do a 450 mile bicycle ride on the Erie Canal in Buffalo Dahl. You don't want to sit down after you've been bicycling about 450 miles. It's a beautiful ride, as is the Colorado River going through the Grand Canyon, or horse packing up in the Tetons. And then every summer for the last 36 years, I've spent about two, maybe three months up in Alaska. Now it's, in 40 years of having fun. My sister said I shouldn't be allowed to celebrate Labor Day. She said, how can you do that? You gotta be ashamed of yourself. Seeing all these great sights around the world, on the cruise ships, on the tours, and then river boats as well. This is the Orinoco River down in South America, to the Amazon, the Orinoco. In Europe, we're doing the Danube, doing the Rhine, some of the rivers over there. In China, the Yangtze. And then in the United States, doing the Mississippi, the Ohio, going from great places like Chattanooga all the way down to New Orleans, on the Tennessee River and the waterways there. And then taking tour groups to see what I think is some of the most moving sites in the United States. Looking at these great battlefields where that four year clash took place. The closest one, like up here in Chattanooga, going to Chickamauga, going to Gettysburg, Fredericksburg, 
Uh, even to Andersonville, it's not a more heartbreaking place, I think, anywhere than Andersonville. Now, while all of them are exciting and interesting to me, they're all a lot of fun to write about them. I was one of the contributing writers to the Chicken Soup for the Soul series of books. Did about 900 magazine articles, what it's like to run with the bulls, run from the bulls as it is in Spain. Of all the foolishness that I've done, that's the only one I won't be doing again. But it was exciting. As was walking in the Ardennes every Christmas to see what the 101st Airborne became immortal with the Bible there of the bulge. Then a number of about 23, 24 books I did on cities around the United States and commemorative books. This is one that was released when I did the 100th anniversary of the Greek community in Birmingham. My parents and grandparents immigrated from Greece and a novel as well. Now all of it has been fun, all of it has been exciting, none more so than right where we're gonna visit tonight. Chattanooga, the great fight for Chattanooga. You talk about Battle of Gettysburg, a battle of Shiloh, a battle of Fredericksburg. This was uh, so involved because it was not just, as you know, Chattanooga, it was in Chickamauga, it was in Georgia, it was back in Tennessee. It took place at the third week of November in 1863. Now why Chattanooga? Why was that such an important spot? Well, it was a railroad crossing. Only about 2,500 people were living there at the time of the war, but it became a very important rail center for the South. It began as a little landing on the Tennessee River. They called it Ross's Landing. It became a very active area there before the railroads even came. Chattanooga was around about 1839. Well, this rail center would continue to develop, and what it was doing was connecting over here. Chattanooga, you're looking to the west, over to Memphis, all the way across through Georgia to the coast. You could go north into Knoxville. Even here, we're going to look at the sites there in the area that we're looking at. Now, it began to develop along an industrial line, almost exactly like Birmingham. The pig iron mills, the steel manufacturing that was taking place, making it very important for the southern states, which would make it an ideal target for the Union when they were coming after it. Not only to disrupt and destroy the rail center, but the industrial capacity that the city had as well. There's the Tennessee River, absolutely beautiful, and you see what went on here. One of the few rivers in the United States that flows from south to north. It begins flowing southward, it begins over here in the mountains of eastern Tennessee. It flows into Alabama, and then it becomes one of the very few rivers, again in the United States, that leaves the state in which it is born and comes back into that state. As you see, coming out of Alabama, it goes back up into Tennessee, flowing north with this way. Now, again, it, it, it's just a, a magnificent river. We've done the Riverboat programs there, Chattanooga along there. I was talking earlier, we're gonna be doing those programs again next year with the American Cruise Line. We're gonna be stopping in Florence. We did Decatur and Gunnersville before. But you see that flowing out of Tennessee, into Alabama, back into Tennessee. Now, it was very popular in the days of the flatboats before the steam came along, but then the steamboats came, and the steamboats revolutionized. Now it is a much more important shipping hub all the way through the 1840s and 1850s. All the manufacturing activity, the agricultural products that have been growing in the area are going to be shipped on these boats up and down the Tennessee River to major areas. So it was evident that if Chattanooga was to fall during the war, they would lose control of the Tennessee. The entire Tennessee area, the real is the kingpin that would do it. Now there would be some writers who talked about how important this battle was. He said the most formidable terrain in which the United States and Confederate forces clashed in the entire world. That's a major statement, because they clashed in some really horrible places. This, he said, was the very first. General Grant echoed that same thing. He said it was a hellish place to fight. He toured that battlefield after it was over and just saw where these boys met, clashed, and died going up and down Missionary Ridge, Horseshoe Ridge, these places. Now, Chattanooga is an interesting name. Where did it come from? Well, anthropologists tell us that there were five tribes here in this area of the southeast. The Chickasaw, the Choctaw, Seminole down in Florida, the Creek, major in Alabama, along with the Cherokee. They call them sometimes the civilized tribes. These weren't just hunters and gatherers. These people were farming as well. And we'd see pictures of them from the earliest days and we'd see where Chattanooga came from. Of course, there was a Creek word that said Satanooki. Maybe that was the rise, rising to a point. Well, certainly that was Lookout Mountain overlooking the Tennessee River. Cherokee had their words for it that said, end of the mountain. 
So you can take your pick as to which of the tribes actually gave it its name. Choctaw even called it the Choctanuga, fishing village. It would certainly apply in all of those ways. Hi, this is Jordan Collier, host of Historical Insights on Spotify, and you're watching North Alabama Local History. Now, there would be a number of generals who would make their fame here and a number who would be pushed into obscurity. There's a man we all know, Ulysses Simpson Grant, and here's the man who would be pushed into obscurity, the man who began that fight, Rosecrans, William Rosecrans. He would be the one whose career would pretty much finish right here. We would see General Sherman, William Tecumseh Sherman, most hated man for the Confederacy, but he would begin to march to the sea after Chattanooga fell. We would see the time he took and then we'll end up looking at what he did in Atlanta. Was that necessary? Are you making war on civilians? Was it a military target? We debated for a long time. Road to Chattanooga would begin in August of 1863. It wouldn't be in Chattanooga. There would be activity taking place all the way through Tennessee and in Georgia. We see General Rosecrans with about 80,000 men. Now, all those 80,000, according to historians, were not engaged in the fight. There might be anywhere from 45 to 60 who would actually take part of the fight. It began up here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We would see in June of that year, we would see victories by Rosecrans up here in Murfreesboro and in Tullahoma. Now, it was pretty insignificant. If you're not one of, the, if you're one of those 569 now, you don't feel insignificant. But as far as major bloodbath, winning two battles with less than 600 casualties, you've done a pretty good job. He's going to be moving now. He's going to be following up on those campaigns over here in Murfreesboro and in Tullahoma and start his drive towards Chattanooga. He's going to be moving on all fronts, all in his different commanders are going to be put, that's your goal. Chattanooga is the goal. Now, who would be facing him? You know, this man. <laughs> this would be the Confederate commander, General Braxton Bragg. We're going to see careers that rise and careers that would fall. His would fall after this. He's got about 50,000 men, which in those days are pretty good size to have a Confederate force under your command. He'd have a couple of other commanders that you're sure you've heard about. The bishop, the fighting bishop. This man was a bishop in the church, Leonidas Polk. William Hardy, another one of the famous commanders that he had, and Simon Bolivar Buckner. Let's see a little bit more about this guy. He's a big deal at West Point. Now, I was a cadet at West Point, class 68. I began in 1964. We'll show you a little bit about what happened during that time. But Camp Buckner in New York is named after him, and that's where we began our basic training in the summer. They called it Beast Barracks, when you go into West Point in June and start school in September. And then one that everybody knows, and one I think one of the most dashing cavalry commands, Nathan Bedford Forrest. You see the 30 horses that this guy had shot out from under him, and it just wasn't his time to die. He, and the thing, and they talk about him too, even at West Point when he was a Confederate, he said one of the few that came in as a private and worked his way up to become a general officer, he got the star. No one that they found has done exactly that. There would be appointed colonels or majors or whatever, light colonel, full colonel, this guy came in as a private, he would become a general officer. And then the man that called states' rights is, this guy was a very apt opponent of states' rights. Now Bragg, with this army moving towards him, after having seen the Federals win in Tullahoma and in Murfreesboro, is pushing back. He's gonna move all the way back here. Forces are gonna strike him in to Chickamauga, Georgia. He didn't want to engage them in Chattanooga. And there's a, a lot of have been written about why they didn't just go ahead and, and mix it up right there. He had at his disposal about 50,000 men, pretty good sized force with a, a pretty strong position, but he didn't. He pulled back to Chattanooga, to Chickamauga, left Chattanooga. Now again, there's another interesting name, Chickamauga River of Death, and it certainly would live up to its name. It is a magnificent landscape there, especially when you go there in the autumn months when you see the colors changing in those cliffs and right along the river banks. Just a beautiful area. Now Brad would set up his defensive line. He's gonna be a, a pretty, matter of fact, it's a pretty widespread defense here from the south all the way. He's gonna look at, at Chickamauga as being his place where he's gonna hold. Now that campaign would begin at the second week in August and run to the third week of September. And how important was it? So much has been written about Chickamauga. It is the very first time that the two great armies would clash in Georgia, major battle, and it would be the most significant defeat 
of the United States Army in the entire Western theater. That's saying a lot. That's saying a lot. It would be the last time that the Confederates would wave a flag, have a victory. It's over with after that. The sea just pretty much collapsed all the way to Savannah. And then, with far as casualties, other than Gettysburg, this was number two. This was number two. Again, saying a lot. How many? Well, we've got Rosecrans coming in here, and he's got the Army of the Cumberland. He's got about 60,000 men he's ready to throw at them in Chickamauga. We would see Bragg with, again, pretty good force, Army of the Tennessee at the time, numbered about the same, maybe 65,000 men. It's like in Shiloh, they were recruiting along the way. We've got some great pictures of the recruiting posters when they were picking up in Tennessee and over here in Georgia. Bragg's got an army in us. Middle of September, 1863. In the morning, we would see the very first clash take place. The Confederates are advancing. By the afternoon, they had done pretty well. Pushed the Federal troops back on all fronts. And this is the cheers are going up here. The Federals are the ones who are retreating. The Confederate boys are moving ahead. However, it didn't crack. The Federal line would hold. Now, there were a couple places where they punched holes in it, but it was never a complete collapse. On September the 19th, the next day, the Bragg did not pursue, unable to punch a hole in the federal line. He came under criticism as why he didn't complete. As many times we, we would see some of these guys at the end of the day, they're so exhausted, you can't get any more out of a man than what he's committed all day long fighting. Well, did they have the chance to really knock a hole in the line, to really put him away or not? Brad would come under fire for that. Rosecrans is in the jacket. He said, we've got a hole in our line, but he had bad intelligence. It wasn't a complete hole. What they were doing was repositioning units. He said, our line is still holding, and it's holding even against Longstreet. Longstreet was talking about, he could push more and more. By the following day, in the morning, we would see things begin to change. Not much until mid-afternoon, when the fighting would become the most fierce. We would see over here at Horseshoe Ridge, this is one of the sites that is visited in the Chickamauga National Battlefield. If you've been over there, this is one of the, the premier sites that you see. And there you see the Union soldiers falling back, falling back. Rosecrans and his guys are on the run. This is a man who kept it from completely falling apart. Thomas, George Thomas, they call him the Rock of Chickamauga. And no less than another general who would later become president of the United States gave him that name, James Garfield. James Garfield was a one star. He said he was standing like a rock. He's the one that held the line together. Now Garfield, as you know, was assassinated. He's one of four presidents who had been assassinated, but he was a Union general during the Civil War. And they talk, another writer named Lambert said, Thomas and two thirds of the Union Army were making a desperate yet magnificent stand that has become a proud part of the military epic of America. Kept it all together, the rock of Chickamauga. Then they sent a telegram to Washington. What a disaster we're having. The report today is deplorable importance. Chickamauga is as fatal a name in our history as Bull Run. Remember that first battle of Manassas, they ran all the way back to Washington, D.C. If, if the Confederates had chased them on, we don't know what the history of the war would have been. But this is the same thing. He says, we are a disaster here. A fatal name in our history, just like Bull Run. Now, Rosecrans goes all the way back to Chattanooga. What about Bragg? Would he chase him all the way back? Well, he chased him back there, but again, he couldn't deliver the knockout punch. The thing they teach you, the first thing in military, is if you don't cut off the head of the snake, he's gonna come back and bite you. So they haven't cut off the head of the snake. They've had a good victory, this first, we'll go back to that one. Brigadier General in the, the Union Army said, the Army now is simply a mob, appears to be neither organization nor discipline. Were a division of the enemy pursued down upon us, I fear the Army of the Cumberland would be blotted out of existence. That's saying a lot, but she said, these guys kept on with the chase, it would have been over right here. Would have been done. We're more of a mob than we are an army. The Bragg would pursue again, but he didn't go all the way. He didn't cut off the head of the snake. What he did was begin a siege of Chattanooga. We saw the siege of Vicksburg. This one would go into the same thing. The Butcher's Bill is what they call, in our day, we call it the after action report. In those days it was a Butcher's Bill. And for the first time, the Civil War would produce images of the horror that's taking place on the battlefield. There's no unwounded soldiers. Every time you, you, you never get over after pulling a trigger, you learn to live with it or you don't. But after seeing these sites, how many of these boys just walked away from it? 
The Union troops were losing at about 14, 15,000 killed, wounded, missing in action, and those who were taken prisoner. But about the same thing for the Confederates who were claiming a victory there. And keep in mind, the Union troops, even though their losses were significant, you're gonna replace those guys. How many times can you keep replacing the dwindling number of Confederates? You couldn't. Butcher's bill would see of 62,000 Union troops engaged, over 16,000 of them would become casualties. Confederates would see up about 18,000 total casualties. Again, more significant because they had fewer men to draw from. Now we're talking about the losses in the Western Theater. This was it, this was it. Second behind Gettysburg in the overall number that would fall here in this fight. One colonel in the army would say the ghastly mangled dead and the horribly wounded strew the earth floor over half a mile up and down the river bank. The dead were piled upon each other like cordwood to make passage for advancing columns. In other days, it were body bags for you. There's no body bags for these guys. to drag them out of the way and let the guys who were moving up to the front get by. This breaks your heart to see that. Now look at the Confederates here who would be killed in action here, losing some key people. Two of their generals were Dashler and Hardin. And then we had a number of the commanders who were wounded in action. Many times a wound is going to later prove fatal or put the man out of action completely. It would be Brown, there would be Gregg, there would be John Bell Hood, and Evan Vander McNair. All these guys were wounded. And four of them were brigade commanders. The, the toughest thing for the guy in the mud, the grunt, is to, to lose the man who's leading you, especially who's a man who's been in the suit before. He's a veteran. You're looking for direction, you're looking for leadership. When your great commanders go down, you gotta put somebody else up in their place, and they had them. Deshler, Smith, Benjamin Hill, and Peyton Colford. Four brigade commanders would be lost. And John Bell Hood, what does it take to get this man off the battlefield? Look at this, uh, he lost an arm, it was useless, after Gettysburg, and it took him off, and they took off his right leg. What does it take to get this guy off the battlefield? He was gonna leave, John Bell Hood. How about wounded and killed in action among the Union troops? They would have a general, that was Lytle, that was killed, and then a number of their brigade commanders would be wounded. Bradley, Starkweather, who would say A.C. Haig, and John Croxton. Again, you lose your leadership and you're in trouble. Four brigade commanders that they had, there was Lytle, there was Haig, there was Baldwin, and this man. They had his tombstone, didn't have a picture of him. These were brigade commanders who had serious losses on both sides, not just in numbers, but men in key positions, leadership positions. There is the creek in the, in the autumn months. It is absolutely beautiful. We can imagine what a nightmare it was at that time. The creek of death lived up to its name. Now, Braxton Bragg would come under fire here. It was technically a victory. You're holding the ground, the Union troops are retreating, they're gonna go into, into lockdown in Chattanooga, and the Confederates are chasing them. But can you claim a victory? You didn't put the knockout points through these guys. You didn't cut off the head of the snake. You allowed them to make their way all the way to Chattanooga. He received a lot of grief from about that. We talk about the line of the Southern soldier, never seen again after Chickamauga. He fought stoutly to the last, but after Chickamauga with the sullenness of despair and without the enthusiasm of hope, the barren victory sealed the fate of the Confederacy. We talked earlier about what a decisive battle it was. And that really points to the fact that many people, many of the military historians feel that this was the end of it. This was the end of it for the Confederacy. If you visit that site, I'm sure many of you have done, it, it's done a magnificent job of recreating what was there. Horseshoe Ridge, where the first of the fighting would take place, once you visit the site, the cannon, all of the different monuments there. It's not grass house, what it looked like then, what they recreated it today. Also, the Brotherton Cannon. It's almost like the same one up in Shiloh. And then this was a mill. You set up the mill by the creeks. This was by Chickamauga Creek. That's what it looked like during the time of the fighting in 1863. You've heard the story of the little drummer boy. And uh, I tell you, if there's anybody who wants to stand in line to shake your hand, I would stand in line to shake this little fellow's hand. John Clem, born in 1851, 10 years before the war started. Okay, he's 11 years old, he decided he's gonna get involved. Ran away from home, he's gonna join the army. Well, you know, recruiters will love to have new recruits, but says, son, come back in a few years, you look, you look young. Hey, I'm not going home. He stayed with, became the mascot of the group that he tried to join. 
and he later was promoted to an NCAA non commissioned officer with a grand salary of $13 a month. Boy, he's made it. And he's got a uniform, his pride and joy. Not just riding along as a mascot, he's the one turned and shot as his group was retreating a Confederate officer who was a colonel. He's riding along with the artillery caissons. Now, they got to have respect for this guy. He was captured in Georgia, and the worst thing he said, the Yankees, I mean, the, the Confederates there, would take my uniform away. And my hat. <laughs> and my hat. Well, he would survive all of that. He applied to West Point. And when you go to go to West Point, you first you apply to a senator or a congressman to get a nomination. If you get the nomination, you compete with the guys who were nominated to get the appointment. 1977, they opened it to women, so men and women at West Point. In these days, and in my day, it was only men. But he's turned down. He wasn't going to be a member of the Long Gray Line. He wanted to be an officer. No, he denied. Well, later on, General Grant said, that's not good enough. I'm going to make him an officer. He appointed a second lieutenant, United States Army. Now, the little fellow wouldn't be just a little fellow after that. He became a, a second lieutenant, Army of the Cumberland. He would see action. He would be wounded twice. It was today two Purple Hearts for this guy. He was finally discharged a year before the war ended in 1864, but he's not through. He promised his mama he'd always go back and get, his, get the education. He graduated from high school five years after the war ended. That wouldn't be the end of his career even then. What's he going to do? Well, he wanted to be the oldest Civil War veteran, still on active duty. They had him all the way into the 20th century, but they weren't on active duty. This guy was. 1916, he promoted to colonel before he retired. Now, in August of 1914, Europe went to war. It would be three years later, in April of 1917, before the United States entered the war. So he's one year away from World War I. If he were to be accepted, he'd have re-enlisted for that. I guarantee you. 1916, in August, he was appointed a two-star major general by special act of Congress. Uh, again, he would have signed up right then if they would have taken it. He died years later in 1937. Little Johnny Flynn, the drummer boy, if you go to Newark, Ohio, you see his picture and his statue right there. A lot of them. Now, speaking of West Point, I want to digress for a minute to show you something that you might find interesting. There's two cadets at West Point. Now, this one is the class of 1861. Now, who do you think that might be? We don't know. Custer. George Armstrong Custer. George Armstrong Custer, when I was at West Point, they told me this is the worst cadet that never made, sorry? That is Custer. I'm going to show you that one in a minute. He's even worse than Custer. The one on the left had a record until I got to West Point in 1964 as having the worst scores in mathematics of any cadet that had ever been to West Point. He said the only reason that they graduated me in 1861 was one, the grace of God, and two, firing Fort Sumter. Well, 1964, I'm up there. I had the grace of God, but I didn't have a Fort Sumter. I had scores, they told me, the worst even than Custer. And I said, well, you graduated him. He said, yeah, but that was 1861, and you didn't need an army officer. I said, but what if you scale the grades? What I have to he said, son, you're not hearing what I'm saying. He said, you'd have to look up to tie your shoes. These are the lowest scores ever. So I washed out. I didn't make it. I didn't make it. Much. I went in as a private when my class was graduating as officer. Did you get a future marriage too, like him? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. He earned it. He Back to what we're talking about. That's Custer. There he is in 1876 when he led the 7th Cavalry up there on Little Bighorn. It was the end of the Custer. But he became the youngest general in the Union Army in the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. Now, here we are back in Chattanooga. Rosecrans has fortified his area. He's got all his pickets out. He figures they can hold out until he's relieved. Are you going to be relieved? Well, Bragg's thinking, I've got to do something. One, do we do a flanking maneuver, get around the defenses? Probably never happened too far. Two, direct frontal assault, too bloody. Or how about number three, settle in for a siege. You're going to starve them out. Can't be resupplied. What's going to happen? Well, the operated missionary ridge over here, they're occupying the high ground. And over here at the south is Lookout Mountain. If you've been to Chattanooga, those are probably the greatest spots or tracing the history of the fight, especially up on Lookout Mountain. Had a great job up there. Now, the Federals are right there at the Moccasin Bend, where Chattanooga is. So Grant and Bragg then would be the ones who would be slugging out for here. Now, who is Grant? You probably read and heard a lot of Grant, West Pointer. 
He was in the class of 1843, put him just in time for the Mexican-American War five years later. But, and he served with distinction, decorated for bravery. And after the war, he had some really lean years. He resigned his commission, because they always do a downsizing after the war is over. He posted out to California, didn't like what he was seeing, so he quit the army. And then he went through a series of failures. He tried farming, can't do it. Real estate, I'm not ready for that. Clerical, that's not me. Luckily, the war came along, and he's appointed colonel in 1861 to Springfield Volunteers up in Springfield, Illinois. And there, one of his first assignments would be the attacks on Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson, which led up to the Battle of Shiloh. And this is where Grant would get his name. General Simon Bolivar Buckner was a Confederate. They were going to lose the fight over here in Tennessee. He said, what terms are you offering for us to surrender? He said, no terms, unconditional and immediate surrender. So he got his name, Unconditional Surrender Grant, U.S. Grant. Ulysses Simpson is what he would go by. Now, that would lead him to become popular when the Battle of Shiloh took place. He's commanded the troops there, and afterwards, he's going to come under fire. They said he was drunk during the time. Many of these officers had alcohol problems in those days, but the press was calling for his head. He said, you can't have a man in charge of this entire army who is a drunk. And the reason that the Battle of Shiloh looked like it was going to be a Confederate victory early on was that they came, never found, didn't have pickets out or anything, and all of a sudden the Confederates were running right through the, the lines of the Union Army. He said he was derelict in his duties. He took it all the way to President Lincoln. He said, you gotta get rid of this man. He said, I can't. He fights. He had fired me and some of these others, so he's looking for a guy who's gonna fight Grant. They call him a butcher because he had just had plenty of men to throw more and more men in the fight. He's gonna win it. Wasn't a great tactician, but certainly he is that. Yeah, so he, he told him send his generals a couple barrels of that same whiskey. He drank. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Again, his star is going to shine at Vicksburg when the siege ended there. And they captured the, the Gibraltar of the Mississippi River. So on October of 1863, he's given an entire command of the Army of the Cumberland. And his Secretary of Stanton told him, so you are to go to Chattanooga. You're going to relieve the siege of the city. And that would be the beginning. Now, the first thing he did was to fire Rosecrans. He's gone. The next thing he did was fire the, uh, to hire the Rock of Chickamauga going after him. Yes, you were going to be in command of the troops there at Chickamauga, at Chattanooga, and you were to hold at all costs. He said, well, hold the town till we start. And they were almost starving. Now, all of the brigade commanders that were with Rosecrans were done. These guys, that would be their last command. If you don't have a field army, you're relieved of command, you're going to be obscure for the rest of your career. And they were. All the two corps commanders were relieved and never had another field command again. And Grant said, we've got to open up what they call the cracker line. We've got that railroad here, but we've got to get over there. Now, the nearest crossing over here, you're probably familiar with Bridgeport, Alabama, up there in the north. Well, the Confederates burned the bridge. Okay, we'll take the road. Well, the road would take you about three weeks. You know, these aren't the interstates that we're traveling on. These guys are just bushwhacking through these old corduroy roads that they had. So a one-hour train ride, you could take even a week to even three weeks to get there. The guys were down to eating just about anything they could find. A quarter pound of pork every three days. That's not going to keep your full belly full. We're facing the foe, he said, and the food at the same time. Now, the rains, as they were coming at the time, just made that impossible. It took us somewhere around 10,000 mules were literally beaten to death to try to get the supplies to Chattanooga. Autumn of 1863, the rains are coming. And it would just be a stench, they said, along that road for all of these horses, the pack animals, that were killed to try to get through. Now, Bragg had his problems, not only with the Union troops facing, but a couple of his own commanders. He's going to get rid of them. He's going to get rid of Polk. He's going to get rid of Hinman. Now, it's, it looks really bad when you're having to relieve some of your top people. The guys in the mud are thinking, whoa, he's getting rid of all of my guys. How bad off are we? October the 4th, 12 senior Confederate generals sent President Jefferson Davis in Richmond, Virginia, a petition. You've got to relieve Bragg. We cannot win with Bragg. Now, these guys would come back and be haunted by what they did. Longstreet, leaving it, he said, I'm convinced that nothing but the hand of God can save us as long as we have our present commander. Can you send us General Lee? 
Well, the answer to that was no. The answer was no. He went on and said, two weeks ago, this army, elated by great victory, was in readiness to pursue a defeated enemy. Today, it is certain that the fruits of victory of Chickamauga have now escaped our grasp. The army of Tennessee, stricken with a complete paralysis, may deem itself unfortunate if it escapes from its present position without disaster. You can't paint a bleaker picture than that for the president of the Confederacy. Now, it got even worse when this guy, Nathan Bedford Forrest, was turned over to relieve his entire command to Joe Wheeler. You're gonna walk away from it. You're gonna turn it over to Wheeler. Well, he's furious. Joe Wheeler's a great guy, but he said, I'm not ready to give up my command. 30 horses shot out under Nathan Bedford Forrest. You know, this just wasn't his time to die there either. He was the one that, that said, at the end of the whole fighting, I was one horse ahead. Now he is gonna do something that you not do in the military. You don't go bursting in to the command post to be commanding officer. He said it was a tirade never heard before or since, not just in the Confederate Army, but any army. Look what he said. I'm not here to pass civilities or compliments with you, but on other business. You commenced your cowardly and contemptible persecution of me soon after battle of Shiloh, and you've kept it up since. You did it because I reported Richmond facts while you reported damn lies. You may not issue any more orders for me, for I will not obey them. Boy, I'm not saying that today. <laughs> if you ever again try to interfere with me or cross my path, it will be at the peril of your life. He's threatening his commanding officer. I mean, that is a pure, pure threat. What's going to happen? Well, he's going to get canned, and Joe Wheeler's going to take over. Look at Joe Wheeler, interesting man himself, class of 1859 became a general officer for the Confederacy, had to make the choice when war broke out. Do I serve with the Union Army that I'm serving now, or do I serve with the Confederacy? Many of them made that choice. You'll see how many in just a few moments. He would be a general officer all the way to the, the Spanish-American War. Look on the far right, who's this? Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt, absolutely, right there. Man is still, won't take off his uniform, like Joe Wheeler. Now look what happened with many of these West Pointers during the war between the states. You have to choose, are you gonna serve from the state in which you were born, or are you gonna serve in the United States Army? 294 graduates became Union generals. South would do pretty good, about half there, 151 became Confederate generals. Had to make that terrible decision. Robert Lee had to make it. Lee would talk about that later. He said, Mr. Blair, I look upon secession as anarchy. If I owned four million slaves in the South, I would sacrifice them all to the Union, but how can I draw my sword on Virginia? Others would make the same thing. Now, if we look at Thomas, he was a Southerner. He was born in Virginia, but he said, no, I'm serving the United States Army. And he did. Rocket took him off. So now we've got Joe Wheeler's cavalry intercepting a supply train that was one of the great coups, one of the great victories here in the fight that wouldn't have many victories in Chattanooga. He captured the desperately needed supplies that the Union troops were hoping for in Chattanooga, killed the mules, not gonna have any help from them. Now they see how bad things are with Bragg and all of the 12 officers who asked Jefferson Davis to relieve him. He decides he's gotta go all the way up there to sea. Went down to Chattanooga and he would meet with these guys. And he said, gentlemen, I'm open to discussion as to General Bragg's fitness to command. Not a sound was made in the room. Nobody wants to speak up. Gentlemen, I'm waiting. You don't keep the president waiting. Finally, somebody did speak up, and it would be Longstreet. He said, perhaps our commander could be of greater service elsewhere. That's a real kind way of, doing, of, of saying he can't lead us. We can't win with this man. Get him out of here. But he stuck. The question has been asked, and many writers have talked and written books about why would Bragg not believe? One answer is, well, who are you going to leave him with? Do you put Longstreet? Do you put who, any of these other guys? Don't know. But immediately after Justin Davis left, leaving him in place, Bragg would go about cleaning house again. Hill and Buckner both would leave, kicked out. And then things would change for the Federals. Four o'clock in the morning, October 27th. On a night where there was no moon, very dark sky, they're gonna sneak by in a very dense fog, building one of these little roads. You're gonna cross over here on the Browns Ferry. Now they did make a crossing, and this is one thing, that, again, that Bragg fell short of. He got word that there was a crossing up here, they're out of here. He said, no, no, that's just a thing. He said, they're not gonna be crossing up there. He said, I'm looking from going down here to Walhatchee. 
So that's where he's going to go down, expecting it, the great crossing of the troops there. He's going to catch them in the water. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't. The Battle of Wallhatchee would be one of the very few nighttime engagements in the American Civil War. These guys didn't fight at night. Difficult communications that they had in the daytime. You can imagine how confusing it is at night. But it was the most significant fight that took place during the Civil War at night, and it was a disaster, again, for Bragg. How many more disasters can you have before you can say this man's not in the right spot? They didn't have enough guys. They split the command. Same thing Custer would do with the little bighorn. You don't split your force when you don't know who you're up against. Now, Halleck would talk about it. He said, well, Hatchie was a long street, an ill-conceived, ill-planned, and poorly coordinated attack that resulted in a shambles. Again, he's not getting much less. So for his trouble, Longstreet is going to be reassigned to Knoxville, but Bragg is still there. Everybody else is reassigned or relieved of command, but Bragg stayed on. Had to know somebody. What he did was to bring his guys over here to Lookout Mountain and then up on top of Missionary Ridge. You hold the high ground. They're going to, they cross the river, but they're not going to get us until they get the high ground. So the supply line now has been reestablished. Get the troops fed, the door open for men and supplies to get into Chattanooga, and they would begin pulling in. 335 march, mile march from Vicksburg, Sherman arrived, so he's ready to throw his troops into it. So it's just a matter of time then before Chattanooga is going to fall. Grant looks at the heights over there, we've got to get to Lookout Mountain, we've got to get to Missionary Ridge. That's going to involve building a little bit of a pontoon bridge across this portion of the Tennessee River and start scaling those heights under fire. And it's what we call naked infantry. You don't have armor, you don't have, you're just going up and down that hill by yourself. It would be that three day fight in November, 1863. First Blood was what would become Grant's headquarters then for the rest of the fight. You got 14,000 Union troops, you got 600 Confederates. You know which way that's going. <laughs> Running those guys off right away, and Grant would set up shop right there, where he stayed the rest of the time. We would see Joe Hooker. We would see John Geary, both of these guys. So you are to cross Lookout Creek. Go after the rebels in, in every place that you find them. Then up the hill, up the hill. There is the crossing here. Hooker's going up across Lookout the Creek. It's another part of the Tennessee River. And you can go up Lookout Mountain. Lookout Valley is where the fight was going, down below, and it would be the heights that they had to scale afterwards. One of the most tragic things, if there's anything more tragic than losing guys in a fight, is to lose your son and to have him die while you're holding. A father holding his son. But that's what happened when his son Edward died in Gary's. My God, I feel the chastisement for the pride I took in him. Can you imagine what, what that must have felt like? Bragstown guys are moving off of Lookout Mountain. They're going back for their Alamo. The last stand is up here at Missionary Ridge. Can you, okay, that is where the most hellish part of the fight is going to take place. These guys got to go straight up the heights. Again, without support of any kind of armor. It was just up that hill. The battle above the clouds, hell in the heavens. It's been called a lot of different things. One of the awards that came around. 1862, Abraham Lincoln first inaugurated the Medal of Honor. Now since then, it has been the highest award for valor that the United States military gives. There have been over 3,500 of them awarded since the first one was authorized in 1862, awarded in 1863. 3,500, one woman as a matter of fact has received it. Interesting story there. Woman was a nurse. A woman was a battlefield nurse. Didn't have doctors in those days. She was a qualified doctor, but a woman, no way you can be a doctor. We'll let you go on the battlefield. Well, she went out under fire where some of the men wouldn't go. Both sides were praising her. She was later awarded the Medal of Honor, but it was rescinded after the war. About 1,500 Medals of Honor were rescinded by the United States Army after they looked at the events surrounding them. Today, you have to above and beyond the call. This guy, one guy threw a bucket across the ship and you know, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. Uh, a, in, in, just before World War II, a Navy admiral pulled a woman out of a fire in a hotel in downtown Tokyo. He was given the Medal of Honor. You don't have it anymore. You've got to be on the battlefield. Now these 3,500 have individuals, one of them would go to this man, Arthur MacArthur, born over here in Massachusetts, but enlisted <coughs> in Wisconsin. 
living in Wisconsin, so he joined the Union Army. He's going to be an officer, and he was going to be leading the charge of Missionary Ridge for his unit. On Wisconsin, he was bringing, as he took the battle flag, all the way to the crib. He fights song for the University of Wisconsin football team on Wisconsin. Well, here's where they got it, from here. Arthur MacArthur, later awarded the Medal of Honor, became a three-star, Lieutenant General, Boy General, they called him. Well, his son was gonna follow in his footsteps. As Douglas MacArthur, born on a military post in Little Rock, Arkansas, he went to the military academy, a prep school for West Point, joined the long gray line at West Point, class of 1903. He's still legendary up there everywhere you find. That was his class of 03. 14 years later, the United States enters World War I. He's gonna be the chief of staff for the Rainbow Division, first group going over to France to fight. And he would be awarded numerous decorations. As John Joseph Pershing, pinning a medal from Douglas Michael, he was completely the poster board for the United States Army. Now, it wasn't just one medal that he would receive. He didn't receive the Medal of Honor in World War I. But look what he got. That's the Distinguished Service Cross. That's number two on down the list. He received that twice, unheard of. And then this is the Silver Star. That's the third highest award for valor. Look how many they gave him. They're just throwing medals at this guy. <clears throat> he was in the right place. Now, later on in World War II, he would be awarded the Medal of Honor. And it's a lot of, of conflict uh, about that because it wasn't a battlefield award. It was for, as the award here at West Point shows, for the preparation of the invasion of the Philippines. Now, a lot of people said, well, you know, you're giving that award for, for valor in combat. He had valor in combat, certainly in World War I, but here he's a battle theater commander. Well, still the question was, should he be? But he was awarded that. Now, here's your trivia question. And this won $10,000 in a trivia contest that I was watching one time. Now, who were the two father and son recipients of the Medal of Honor? We gave you the first one. That's Arthur and Douglas MacArthur. Who was the other? There's been a lot of answers and all of them were wrong, unless you chose Theodore and Theodore Jr. Oh, yeah. Theodore Roosevelt, the Rough Rider. He was Secretary of the Navy. He had been a police uh, commissioner in New York City. He led the first volunteer cavalry division, which he called the Rough Riders, down there in Santiago in Chile. Ah, uh, in Chile, in Santiago in Cuba. San Juan Hill. He's going to lead them up. Matter of fact, the very first time machine gun was used in support of infantry in an attack like this up a hill. It would be 44 years after he died, and he became so famous for this, he became Vice President of the United States. He would die in 1919, and 44 years later, the United States Congress decided what he did at San Juan Hill merits the Medal of Honor. So they awarded him the Medal of Honor. Now his son, would be the commander of the 4th Infantry Division who came ashore the very first general officer and at 56 years old, the oldest guy to come ashore in Utah Beach on the five invasion beaches of Normandy. Just George C. Marshall looked at him, he said, that's the bravest thing I've ever seen is what Ted Roosevelt did at Utah Beach. So the Confederates now pushed back, push back from Lookout Mountain, they're over here on missionary. That's their last stand. That's gonna be it, make it or break it. Well, all of them are together there. They've got thrown all of their eggs in that last basket. And on November the 25th, the battle would begin. It was a hellish fight all day long. The thousands who would die during that day, finally at the end of the day, the federal troops looked over the, the battlefield. They said, they'll be leaving tonight. And they did. Confederates pulled back. Under cover of what would be a lunar eclipse, no moon at all. Now that, many of them thought, oh, that's a bad sign. Yeah. We're leaving, we got a lunar eclipse, the moon's leaving, we're leaving too. Well, it would. Now, here is where Bragg finally took blame. He said, disaster to Missionary Ridge admits of no palliation, and it's justly discrediting me as a commander. I fear we both erred in the conclusion for me to remain <coughs> command here after the clamor raised against me. In other words, I should have been relieved. Look at the disaster here that I've led. That was it. Butcher's Bill on both sides, over 6,600 casualties for the United States Army and about 5,800, I mean for the uh, American Army, 5,800, 6,600 for the Confederacy. And here is where some famous photographs were taken. There's Grant afterwards looking around at the, the fighting, call it a hellish place to fight. And then just as we saw in February of 1945 on top 
of Iwo Jima at Mount Suribachi. They took that famous photograph. They're doing the same thing here upon Missionary Ridge. That's the flag that they carried with them to take a picture of the Union Army finally having from the Confederates off of Missionary Ridge. It's pretty much over now and Bragg begins retreating. He's gonna continue on through Georgia. From Cumberland, he's gonna go all the way down to Dalton, Ringgold Gap. He's fighting little actions along the way, but it's just really a stalling action. There's not much he can do. These guys are whipped and they're leaving. Now that would begin in Sherman, with Chattanooga in control, Chickamauga has been fought, they're in control. Path is open all the way to the sea. Now he didn't get support from the others, it would be Sherman on his own. And that's why he vilified it for what he did. November of 1863 is when Chattanooga ended the fighting there and he would continue on across the state of Georgia all the way to the ocean. July of September of 1864 is when he arrives there at Savannah. Having completely destroyed the city of Atlanta, burned it to the ground. Was that necessary? Was that a war on civilians? He said, well, war is hell. Well, but do you make war on civilians? And what does it do to the guy on the front to see that his family has now had their house burned down, all of their pigs and horses and, and cattle have been taken away? This guy's going to leave. But that was it. It was all over. And then look at what we're going to end with some of the time when these guys got together. Many of them lived into the 20th century here, and their reunions had to be some of the most emotional that you can imagine. Both of them coming together, Confederates and the Union soldiers. They write about it, round about us are heroic fields, round about us the dead of both armies sleep while the living survivors are the war-worn and veterans. Look at these fellows here. The legions of Grant and Lee gather here fraternally, recalling the incidents of that great struggle. These men gaze again on the unforgettable pictures that have hung these many years upon the chamber walls of their memory. And most of these guys are in their 80s by now. Some will be in their 90s, shaking hands for the last time. Today they and we thank God that the sword has been sheathed, the cannon silenced, the muskets stacked, the war flags furled, and that once again, Pennsylvania and Virginia can come together. So, we've thrown a lot on the wall here at, in the last uh, four or five minutes. I hope you enjoyed that look at something I know that you've heard of, I know that you've read about, but hopefully I've added a little something to it with uh, what we've presented here, maybe some things that you haven't thought about as well.